Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 48 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of March 15th to 21st, 2012. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next, oh, almost half hour, I'm gonna be your renter and raconteur. I'm gonna be talking about things important to me and that I think deserve your attention, deserve to be important to you. Uh, as always, any comments or reactions to the show, uh, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple times during the show. And you can get the uh, email address from there. I only ask that if you do send me email, that in the subject line you include something like, um, you know, your cable show or left side of the aisle or something so I know it's not spam. And be a little patient. I do answer my mail, but yeah, I can sometimes be a little slow about it. All right, so let's get started with that. I, uh, I can start today with some good news. I always like to start with good news whenever I can. This time I got a couple of pieces of good news. Uh, the first one is that last Thursday, the Senate rejected an attempt by... Um, by Republicans, by the goppers as I call them, to fast track the construction of the Keystone XL crude oil pipeline. Uh, the amendment uh, proposed would have done that by stripping the State Department of its role in negotiating uh, the pipelines. It, the State Department's involved because it crosses an international border, but they would take that authority away from the State Department and hold it in Congress. Now, the thing is, I've talked about this before. This pipeline, this Keystone XL pipeline, would transport tar sands from Alberto, Alberta, Canada, uh, to refineries in Texas. Tar sands are about the worst, ugliest, messiest, most environmentally bad way to get oil there is. This stuff is so sticky, so gummy, so tarry, that you actually have to heat it up and mix it with water just to enable it to be able to flow through the pipes. Now, the supporters of the pipeline prate on about why it'd be a good thing. Uh, two things. First, they talk about jobs. And, uh, well, I'll refrain from calling it a lie because there apparently would be some jobs uh, produced. A small number, maybe as few as 2,500 jobs. And the jobs would be temporary. Temp a, few, a few temporary jobs. So, well, I guess in truth that when you bear in mind that the... Uh, uh, a good definition of a lie is a statement made with the intent to deceive. Yeah, to talk about jobs is a lie. The other thing is a, f a flat out lie. This is the claim that this will reduce our dependence on foreign oil. I mean, the first thing is that this oil comes from Canada. It is foreign oil. Um, I mean, I know like Goldie Hawn said in that old movie that, you know, Canada's kind of attached, but um, still, Canada's a foreign country. This is foreign oil. And secondly, the idea that is being thrown around that the fact that this oil is refined in Texas means that the oil will stay in the U.S. is completely bogus. It's inane. Oil is sold on a world market. Okay, the idea that refined in Texas equals stays in the U.S. is just complete nonsense. And anyone who tells you, anyone who tells you otherwise, anyone who tells you that that is not nonsense, they're either lying to you or they have no idea what they're talking about. There is no third option. So uh, I'm actually th think that anything that delays that pipeline, any anything that hinders it, yeah, that's actually good news. Now, the other bit of good news is actually a twofer. Two states have joined South Carolina in seeing their reactionary attempts to hinder the ability of poor and minority voters to cast a ballot has been blocked, at least temporarily. First off, this past Monday, the Justice Department uh, blocked a new law in Texas requiring uh, photo IDs in order to be allowed to vote. Uh, the Justice Department said that the data from Texas, from the state itself, showed that almost 11 percent of Hispanic voters, and that's a rate twice as high as non-Hispanic voters, that 11 percent of Hispanic voters did not have the required photo ID, and that the attempts, uh, any, any programs to try to ameliorate that, to get more IDs into the hands of people, they, they simply were inadequate, simply weren't there. 
Significantly, and this is what I think is really significant, the DOJ also said that the state of Texas has supplied no evidence to show that, uh, that there was any um, fraud involving voter impersonation that would not already be addressed by existing state laws. In other words, the state of Texas provided no evidence at all to show that this law would do anything other than suppress Hispanic turnout. Uh, the second bit of good news, this also came on Monday, and this was in Wisconsin. Uh, a circuit judge named Richard Neese issued a permanent injunction against Wisconsin's new photo ID law. This required certain government-issued photo IDs, again, in order to be able to vote. He declared, and I'm quoting here, voter fraud is no more poisonous to our democracy than voter suppression. He held that the law unconstitutionally burdens the rights of eligible citizens. Now, the simple fact is, these laws and the others like them are about one thing and one thing only. They are about hindering the ability of poor and minority voters to get to the polls solely and precisely because the reactionaries believe, with cause, they believe that those populations are more likely to vote for Democrats than Republicans. This is not about preventing fraud. It is not about preserving the integrity of the, of the ballot or any of the rest of that bills they spew out. This is about power, period. Uh, and to consider this, in a recent editorial, the Washington Post uh, noted that Virginia might be in a similar position as Texas and South Carolina, because like those two, Virginia is among the states whose voter laws have to be approved by the Department of Justice because those states have a history of voter discrimination. Um, the... Uh, Right now, there's a, there's been a law in Virginia which has been passed, but as far as I'm aware, has not yet been signed by the governor, although he probably will sign it. Um, but that vote is, again, for a photo ID law. You know, it's apparently this law is not as bad as those in Texas and South Carolina, but still has many of the same failings. But for me, now, this is the real takeaway from that editorial. I'm going to quote this editorial, this Washington Post editorial. In a conversation with senior Virginia GOP lawmakers recently, we asked if there was any evidence of a pattern of voting fraud in state elections that would justify more stringent voter ID rules. One state senator said he had heard of such fraud. We asked our question again. Was there a pattern of fraud that would raise systemic doubts about the integrity of Virginia elections? The senator said no. None of his fellow Republicans contradicted him. These people are not even pretending anymore that this is about anything other than suppressing the vote of their political opponents. And so the fact that these laws are getting blocked, that at least some of them are losing, that, uh, that's good news. All right, we're going to move on from there to our regular feature, our weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. This is another week where we've seen attacks on, on the rights of women, on women's ability to make decisions, on women's autonomy. Attacks, more specifically here, not only on the choice uh, to terminate a pregnancy, but on the choice of pregnancy. That is, attacks on birth control. Now, 2001, uh, 2011 rather, 2011 was a big year for the keeping barefoot and pregnant crowd. State legislators introduced over a thousand anti-abortion laws in 2011, 135 of them passed. Seven states either defunded or moved to defund Planned Parenthood, and the Republicans used Planned Parenthood as a bargaining chip in budget negotiations. Republicans in Congress also introduced mandatory ultrasound bills. They tried to narrow the definition of rape to forcible rape, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. And they banned the District of Columbia from using its own locally raised money to help poor women afford abortions. More recently than that uh, came the failed attempt to overturn that uh, new mandate that contraception coverage be included uh, in health insurance. There was a proposed amendment that would have allowed employers to deny any employee any health coverage for any moral reason the employer cared to cite. 
Now, despite the astonishing breadth of that language, the fact is no one on either side of this debate even pretended that this was not about birth control. But outrage of the week, okay, here are just a couple of very recent examples. On March 8th, International Women's Day, the House Judiciary Committee, uh, uh, Subcommittee on the Constitution held a hearing on a bill that would make it illegal for anyone other than a parent to accompany a young woman across the state line to get an abortion, even if the parents are abusive, even if they are absent. In Kansas, a bill is currently making its way through the state legislature that would deny women who got abortions the ability to deduct the cost on their taxes as a medical expense. And to add insult to injury, it would also, get this, put a sales tax on the procedure. Oh, and by the way, there's not even exemption for rape victims for this. The sponsor of the bill is a guy named Lance Kinzer, and he refused to answer inquiries from the media about this. A staffer said he rarely talks to the press, which, considering the kind of stuff he's pulling, doesn't surprise me. But this is the one that really got me. And what really got me about this is that I, I was shocked to learn, I didn't know this, what I'm about to tell you is already law in nine states. Last week, the Arizona Senate passed a bill that would prohibit medical malpractice lawsuits against doctors who withhold information from a patient if they think that information might encourage that woman to have an abortion. I'm going to say this again to try to make sure it's clear. Under this bill, a doctor could knowingly and willingly withhold information from a pregnant woman patient if that doctor thinks that information might cause her to have an abortion. The doctor could knowingly and willfully withhold relevant medical information from a patient and be completely free from any possibility of a malpractice suit. What's more, if that same child is born and is born with a disability, under this law you cannot sue the doctor on, on, on behalf of the child. Put more bluntly, in order to keep you from seeking an abortion, the doctor can lie through their teeth and get away with it. Now, the Arizona legislator who's, who sponsored the bill said this is because she didn't think claimants should be able to blame a doctor if a baby is born with disabilities. But the best way to prevent a suit like that is not to hide the information, but to reveal it. To tell the woman that your child is, is quite probably going to be born with these kind of disabilities. And at that point, that woman and hopefully together with her significant other, if there is one, can decide whether or not to proceed with the pregnancy. Because then if the child was born with disabilities, they knew it going in. This bill is not about sparing doctors frivolous lawsuits. That's, that's crap. That's a lie. Shockingly, nine states, Pennsylvania, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, Indiana, um, Idaho, uh, Missouri, Minnesota, and North Carolina, already have such laws on the books. And this proposal is also part of that Kansas law that I just mentioned. And in fact, the Pennsylvania law was upheld by a federal appeals court. I really have a problem getting my head around this. I really have a problem getting my head around the idea that it can be lawful, it can be proper, it can be legitimate, it can be decent to empower doctors to actively lie to patients, not to protect the patient, but in order to force that doctor's notion of morality onto the patient, regardless of that patient's beliefs or desires. Now, I know some of what I just told you is not new, but some of it is, and it is an outrage, and it is the outrage of the week. And we're going to take a quick break. And we're back. Uh, something I want to talk about, I haven't talked about it. Um, I've wanted to, but I haven't partly because uh, I find the subject emotionally painful. Um, the subject is the war in Afghanistan. Um, I haven't talked about it. It's hard for me to talk about it, but uh, some things in the last week or so have kind of brought this into, into uh, deeper focus. 
And um, Afghanistan is now our longest war, our longest war. We've been at war in Afghanistan for over 10 and a half years, since October 2001, the longest war in our history. There are 90,000 U.S. troops there now. Uh, and by current plans, there will be some troops there uh, for more than another two and a half years until the end of 2014. And even that thing comes with an asterisk. There right now are ongoing talks with the Afghan government of President Hamid Karzai um, for a strategic partnership agreement that would enable U.S. troops, and the number is unclear. I've seen some reports that will be up to 25,000. U.S. troops could remain in Afghanistan for another 10 years until 2024. They just wouldn't be called combat troops, so that's apparently supposed to make it okay. The war has cost us over $500 billion. Uh, nearly 2,000 U.S. troops have been killed. Nearly 3,000 total NATO troops have been killed. But that, in fact, itself raises the first thing that causes me pain about here. Whenever we see casualty figures about the war in Afghanistan, that's what we see. We see the U.S. casualty figures, and sometimes the NATO figures are added on. What about the Afghans? Don't they have an army? Don't they get killed in this war? Why are they invisible? Where are those numbers? You have to dig to find the numbers of Afghan casualties. Well, according to the Congressional Research Service, as of the end of January 2012, more than 6,000 Afghan soldiers and police have been killed in the war. That is uh, more than twice as many as all the NATO allies together. It's more than three times as many as the number of American troops killed. And yet, that very, very rarely even gets mentioned. It's like the Afghans themselves, they just don't count. And even there, there's something missing. There's something missing. Civilians. Do you have any idea how many civilian casualties there have been? How many civilian deaths there have been in the war in Afghanistan? Well, the fact is, I can guarantee you that whatever figure's in your head, whatever figure you have heard or imagined or whatever, I can tell you that it's nothing more than a wild guess because the fact is, no one knows. For the first six years after our invasion, from 2001 through 2006, nobody counted civilian deaths. It wasn't until 2007 that anybody even started to, trying to keep track of them. That's how little they mattered. Well, since 2007, the best estimates are about uh, 12,000 Afghan civilians have been killed in the war. And you have to dig, you really have to dig to find that number. And I can guarantee you that if you do, if you do that digging and you find that number, you will find right along with it some statement along the lines of, well, you know, most of these civilian deaths have been called by the anti-government forces as if it makes a difference to the dead who pulled the trigger, especially at a time when, when it, is, it, is, it is our presence that's causing the violence. It may come as a shock to you. We are not seen as saviors or liberators in Afghanistan. We are seen as invaders and occupiers. And, and, and the thing is, that's assuming these, these figures about, the, about civilian deaths are accurate and the proportion is accurate. There was a conference on March 4th in Afghanistan between some leaders of NATO forces, some of the military leaders, and some uh, Afghan politicians, office holders, security experts, and so on. And at that, uh, at that meeting, the NATO claimed that 77% of civilian deaths have been caused by the, by the insurgent forces. Those claims were greeted with scorn and were called laughable. After all, though, I mean, these claims, they must be true. I mean, after all, we said it. It's got to be true. Besides, whenever we kill civilians, it's a mistake. It's a regrettable accident. One, one news article I just, I just uh, saw said the war in Afghanistan has become a series of U.S. missteps and violent outbreaks. That's a quote a series of U.S. missteps and violent outbreaks. And notice first the passive voice on the violent outbreaks. It's just, they just kind of happen. 
It's got to happen. Nobody's actually responsible for this. But when we do something wrong, it's a misstep. It's an unfortunate incident. Like, for example, burning a Koran. Now, I don't need to tell you about this. You've heard about this. You've heard about the Koran that was found partly burned in a trash pile. The thing is, there's a couple of things you need to understand about this. First, the riots that ensued were not actually about the burning of the Koran. That was just the proximate cause. The truth was, this was actually just a breaking point of resentment and frustration. Look, here, here it is, okay? We have occupied their country for more than a decade. We have killed what General Stanley McChrystal himself called an amazing number of innocent civilians at checkpoint shootings. We have repeatedly killed their civilians in airstrikes. We continue to imprison their, system, uh, their citizens for years on end without charge amid credible reports of, of torture. Our soldiers, the pride of our nation, have shot Afghan civilians for fun, have urinated on their corpses, and have displayed their bodies as trophies, and we wonder why the Afghans don't like us. The second thing you need to understand is that to Muslims, the Quran is not just another holy book. Okay? Rather, the recited Quran, as I, as I understand this and as other people have explained it to me, the recited Quran invokes the actual presence of God. So rather than comparing it to the Bible, a better comparison would be the reverence with which Catholics treat the consecrated host at the Mass. That's a closer comparison. And by the way, this also raises for me something else about this whole business. How did it happen? I mean, how did this book wind up in the trash? How did it wind up? How did it get there? I mean, this may have been completely innocent. Yeah, it may have, may have been. But, I mean, but it, at some point, um, someone had to have picked up this book. I mean, I can understand how it got burnt, okay? I can understand how it got burnt. I mean, you're soldiers. You're told there's a pile of trash to be burnt, and you just take it and you burn it. You don't pay attention to what's in it. But how did the book get in there? Again, it may have been innocent, but it just seems to me that at some point, somebody had to have picked up this book. Never mind what it was. It's a book. Just picked up a book, looked at it, and went, ah, throw it in the trash. How do you just throw a book in the trash? Especially when it's a book, you don't even know what it is. You don't know if it's valuable or not. I mean, it was, it was probably, it was probably uh, printed in, uh, in Pashto or one of the other languages of Afghanistan. And whoever threw this away, I mean, I can assume that, uh, that uh, they didn't speak Pashto, which should, if they did, it would be even worse because then they would know it was a Koran. I mean, I, I, I just don't understand how you can just pick up a book and just throw it away. I just don't, I just don't get that. But maybe it was entirely innocent, okay? Maybe it was just another accident, another unfortunate incident, because after all, they all are. Every misstep we make is an accident, a regrettable mistake. Either that or it's some poor schmuck driven mad by the pressures of war to where he goes in and shoots down 16 people in cold blood. Now, again, you've heard about this. I don't need to tell you about that. But it does deserve to bring up another thing about the war in Afghanistan that brings me pain. In reporting on this, there was a headline in the Boston Globe that said, and I'm quoting, shooting deaths of civilians complicate Afghanistan mission. Because that's what's important about 16 people being murdered. It complicates the mission. It's another unwelcome challenge. Another, another, another article expressed concern that this might delay the signing of the strategic partnership agreement. But in fact, we don't have to worry. The Obama administration has said, this will not change our policy about the war. In fact, it makes him more determined to get our troops out. Um, but don't worry, there will be no rush to the exits. Oh no, the withdrawal has to be done responsibly, he said. Even as the killing spree might lead to the Taliban being able to recruit more people and anti-Americanism might rise. And what does all this have in common? It's all about us. I mean, the people of Afghanistan don't even enter this picture except as backdrops for our self-centered uh, uh, our self-centered narrative. They just serve as as placeholders on our punch card. 
No, I don't care what you thought about the original invasion of Afghanistan. I, I, it's not really important right now. The fact is, whatever you thought about that, whatever justifications might have been offered for the original invasion, they have long since been drowned out by the hum of the drones, the blasts of the mortars and the IEDs, and the shrieks of the wounded and the mourning. All there is left in Afghanistan now is the steady drip of blood and the slow grind of death amid the shatters and tatters of flesh. It is time to stop now. And that's not even a radical position anymore. Even conservatives agree to it. A new Washington Post ABC poll just said, in fact, that 54% of Americans say that we should get out on, according to the timetable. We should get out according to the timetable no matter what. 60% said the war was not worth fighting. It's time to stop. And I don't mean two and a half years from now. I mean now. All right, last thing, very quick. I got about two minutes left. I think I'm going to get this in. Uh, it's everything you need to know. And in this case, it's everything you need to know about the danger of the moment in three sentences. I had somebody the other day tell me that Barack Obama was taking our freedoms away. And I said to my wife later, says that, well, he's right, just not in the way he meant. He meant things like, oh, like the uh, health insurance, which I'm sorry, that is not taking your freedom away. But our freedom is at risk. Our freedom is in danger. And I'm going to tell you in three sentences how close that danger is. One, I spoke last week about Eric Holder talking about the uh, supposed ra legal rationale for the authority of the president on his own authority without any outside review to order the murder of an American abroad. Two, on March 7th, during his testimony before the House Appropriations Committee on his agency's budget, the, uh, Robert Mueller, the director of the FBI, was asked if Holder's logic could also apply to American citizens inside the U.S. Three, Holder said he didn't know. He didn't know if the president had the authority to order him to murder American citizens on American soil without order or court order or, or any sort of review. And that is everything you need to know. Or right, I'm out of time. I got to go. Um, we'll be back next week with, with more stuff. In the meantime, I just so again want to thank everybody here at CCAT for all the help that they've given me. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. You just try to have the best week you can, okay? And we'll see you next week.